Oh, the heater has been going for six minutes and we're at 10.9 degrees, so we've got a 1.5 degree in Greece. My solar voltage is only at 22 volts, so we're in our mains because the batteries are flat. And the secondary solar voltage is nearly flat at 12.23 volts, we've got a 12 volt system and a 24 volt system. Awesome, so all the lights. Everything you see is mains voltage today. Anyway, about two years ago, maybe longer, I found this in a skip. It was in pieces. There was three pieces to it. The motor casing was one bit hanging off. The gearbox unit was one bit hanging off and then these two bolts I've scalvaged from something else and these two bolts I've scalvaged from somewhere else and the drum these two bits of metal and this angle bracket were separate with this on it so I picked this up, I saw this, I thought, pick that up, oh, like that, with this drum on it. And then I saw this bit, I thought, oh, that's definitely part of this, same colour. Then I saw this, oh, like that. And then in the same skip I could see that these were missing, and I saw these. So I picked them up. And there was no way I was going through it for the screws and nuts and bolts if they were actually in there. So, I've just was a couple of 10mm bolts in the end there, these are supposed to be Allen key bolts, cap screws like those. I think. Anyway, when I stripped it down, as you've already seen, the brushes were knackered. I think they stripped it down and missed the fact that it had got a hole in the wire and I haven't insulated this because I won't need to I'll put a cable tie around it inside there anyway I used some electrical glue and we're going to see how well it works so let's take these bolts out and show you inside you don't need to see me rebuilding a DC motor. You can see many, many people rebuilding a DC motor. Now these winches come with relays to control them. I ain't got that. So I had to order one. I hope why are you coming off now? Oh, it's the bearing, isn't it? That's come off the bearing. I will get it off. It will come off. It will. On the other hand, this is frozen, by the way. Well, nine degrees. And it's pretty cold. Pretty chilly. So it might not want to come off. Right, I'm going to get that off. Hold on a second. Well, I forget about the part that's in the lathe here. I'm talking about brushes. I ordered these brushes many moons ago and I know full well that they do not fit the project that's what they look like <coughs> alright let's put that somewhere else so it isn't going to do that again I might stop doing this <laughs> anyway so this is the original brushes and they are worn out and chafed through possibly the reason why the motor was putting smoke out I'll have to bear that in mind when I'm repairing it yeah that's definitely uh, had some arcing happening on that definitely Anyway, these are worn out and they've worn so far that that has arced out. Great. And if we look at the wire in that, it's pretty beefy stuff. 
in, comparis in comparison to the wire that has come on the new brushes. So these new brushes are meant for AC, high voltage, and these are meant for DC, low voltage. So it's all about the amperage that these put through. And these will be taking a lot of amperage so they have a thick wire. The other thing you need to know is that these brushes have got a side entrance and these have got a back entrance. Also, although these are very, very, very close to the size of the old brushes, they do not fit inside the receiver. So this is what holds the spring. And as you can see, the receiver wouldn't want the wire coming out sideways. So I could literally do that. See what I'm saying like that? Possibly. But, no. Now, I've never ever done brushes before. So we need to do some investigation. Let's have an investigation. Yeah, it's wire glue. I've bought wire glue and I'm using wire glue to glue the brushes together. So I've just spent 10-15 minutes with a junior hacksaw, standard blade and some 120 grit sandpaper. Now clearly they're the ones which have the wire in them. As you can see I've cut the wire off and I've cut through the wire cutting them off. So they all ended up about the same. That one's got no wire sticking through it. That one has. And so is that one. So we've got so much like that, which were the ends, and they have no interruptions in them at all. And then so much like that, with a little bit of divots where I've just pulled the last little bit of copper out of them. If it all looks right, what I will use, what I'll do is I'll use this plastic keeper as a jig. I'll put the part in loosely like that to the loose section and then drill in a little bit of a divot yeah just drill a bit of a divot in them do that times five and then drill most of the way through them oh it's got a bit of copper in it and then drill most of the way through them And I need to know what size to drill them and how I get the copper to stay in now. So I'm going to research a little bit and see what type of glue is appropriate for gluing these in with because I think they were glued in. Righty ho. I have installed the spring. Conveniently, it comes to a, a positive stop as the spring bottoms out. So that is going to be my marking point. So I'll just bring my three mil drill up there. I don't know if that's actually done anything. Well, not a lot, but yeah, a bit. Let's see what we got. A load of carbon dust. So I've got the startings of a hole. I will finish that off not by hand. So, as I was saying, and by the way, when I took it out, this bearing didn't come out. It pulled the bearing at the bottom. Very exciting. The wavy washer is in there to hold the pressure on. Extremely happy now. As you can well imagine. So, the side which had the damage, the insulator is slightly, oh, it's going to come to pieces. Nothing is going easy on this, it wants to pull itself to pieces constantly. 
but the insulator is slightly damaged as can be seen there again I am not worried about that either it was damaged by the person who took it to pieces in the first place or it was damaged because of overheating when the bushes were touching so I'll have, uh, I'll have to go with this can't do it one handed it ain't happening one handed anyway these bushes are slightly too too long so I am going to go through the tedious procedure of putting them into their unit test fitting them until they just fit in and then I'm going to fit the springs fit the brush packs and we'll get some power to it so I fitted them in there and they need to come back until they're nearly flush with the units so this is the piece of sandpaper that I used for a start so as you can see it's black carbon all over them and that diameter is almost perfectly that diameter. It's a little bit smaller, so I guess wrapping the sandpaper around twice will do the job. And since this carbon is extremely soft, it won't take long. There we go. No, not quite there, but certainly getting there. So here's the, here's the brush unit and the ceramics here, whatever they are, plastic ceramics. The brush is just protruding out of it and I think they've got to be literally flush. Righty ho, the brush back has been sanded I use the tube like I said and now I am setting up for a resistance check let's go for a diode check to start diode check will give it the non-latching beep so we have continuity through the windings to the side and insulation to earth. Let's try it in 20 mega ohms. Nothing showing. And of course that'll be zero. Perfectly zero there. So let's see how many ohms are through the windings. Two mega ohms, 20,000 ohms. 2,000 ohms, 20,000 ohms, 2,000 ohms, into the ohm range. It's got 0.8 ohms of resistance through that winding. Let's just turn the motor slightly. Yeah, it's changing. So the motor, oh no, the motor's turning with me. Sure, if the motor is actually going to turn, it should. Got plenty of play. I suppose 
there's only one way to find out, isn't there? Okay, I'm working on the winch and I'm making the base plate which is going to hold the relay. Here is the relay. It fits on that way and it fits on that way. Although it fits on this way better because it's almost perfectly the right width. Right, so as you can see there is no marks on that piece of steel. How's that? There we go. Yeah. It's just a rough piece of steel. It's not that rough. I have squared it up. And its measurements are 112.09 millimeters by 117.03 millimeters. I thought it was important to put the decimals in because I'm converting from metric to inches because this is an inch mill. Now I am going to move over my first hole. That should be five millimeters in from the end. And looks around about five millimeters in from the end. Just looks a bit more than five. Actually, be six millimeters in from the end. Sorry, six millimeters. Six point oh something. Whatever two hundred thirty-seven is, or two hundred thirty. Actually, two hundred thirty-eight on this one. That should be two hundred thirty-eight thousandths in, which is about six mil. Now I could go through the hassle of putting all the different drill bits into there but I don't need to because I can do this I can move another 197 should put me on 34. So that should have put me five mil further this way and five mil further the other way as well. <laughs> no, <laughs> this should be right. do the next hole and the next hole should be 126 1 inch 260 let's see so I should be able to just wind straight across to it and it'd be 94 mil 94 94 increments on the Scale, that should be it. I'll just need the scales to make sure. That should be coming down 32 millimeters. So I'll just hold that there and make sure that looks about 32 millimeters. Right, 
go, and this is where we see if me holes are going to line up. So these should be around about 90, I think. That's 90. That's 90. That's good. These should be under a 5. That's under a 5. That's 105. So that's 90 by 105. And then these should be 32 the 100. So that's 100. That looks 32. And that looks 32. So, what I've got to do now is put some 3.5mm holes in these to take wood screws and countersink them and then drill and tap these for M5 or M6, whatever I can fit in. and not put my bottle in the way. Anyhow, that's those holes all done. And 
will now allow me to put wood screws in to screw into the plastic and countersink them so they blow the surface and use some M6 hardware to mount the relay. Just got to decide what else I need to mount on there, the Wi-Fi unit. So I'm going to get the Wi-Fi unit out. I think I'm just going to dust the surface off. Zoom out. So down here we've got some marks. I don't know if you can see them all. Here. It says 34, 37, 94. And the other one says 171. Oh, and then around the front here, I've got some other marks, and they're all down there. I've got one that says 175, one says 178, another one says 35, and the other one says 38. They're quite even on this side. And they all correspond to the XY coordinates of all that lot. Get the relay and see if that fits. Yeah, sure enough, the relay unit fits, and I haven't tightened the bolts all the way out, and we've got wiggle everywhere, and it looks square. The other thing you need to know is I've made it awkward <laughs> because you cannot tighten those screws without removing the relay. Happy days, isn't it? When you do that kind of thing, when you come to sort of this design like that, you go. What prat did that? <laughs> I could have made it another you know, five mil, ten mil further this way, but nope, I can fit way more stuff on now. That'll probably be the only thing that's on there, by the way. Anyway, next is going to be the wireless unit. So there's the wireless unit, and I want it to be something like that, or maybe in the other way. Put the calipers down before I chuck one in a little bit. So I might want it flush to the end, just to give me a little bit of room to work the wires around where I need to. By all intents there's going to be um, a red and a black coming in there from the battery, so they'll be attached there like that. And then the other two wires will be connected to that one and that one and hopefully that will make it work however <laughs> that is not guaranteed hmm. I'm still wanting to get a relay a double acting relay and stick that on top of here as well so I think before I do attach this for permanent, I'm going to make a little test up here and get my multimeter and a 12 volt power supply and oh man, it's all going to happen. Or I may make an L bracket and stick it there like that and stick it there like that underneath to protect the wire even more and give me a little bit more space here so I might just get another piece of 2 mil steel now this piece of 2 mil steel and cut a section out of there like that and so it goes in there and then do that same 100B32 hole pattern in there and then bend it up like that and have that there as an L bracket to, in fact actually I might make it even longer and put it on the inside like that oh yeah so like the bracket would be going up like that and then that would be on the inside and then I'd have all this spare space around the front here if there's any relays or what have you to separate them maybe Maybe, I don't know, offering some kind of protection. So I'm here at the relay for the winch. And the reason why I can start recording stuff is because of this. So I've got a aluminium bracket which I've just made. And I can get it out of one hand, I can get it out of one hand. 
shaft is like that. So as you can see it's a scrap from the lathe. Uh, this is actually this was actually trepanned out of the wheels for the machine movers. And then to make this so it it can go into the other unit, it slides out. Obviously that goes into the camera stand. And now that is exactly the same. It's basically a GoPro mount, but it is now fully aluminium. And obviously it has a pinch, pinch nut. And basically that's the camera mount now. That bit there, which I machined yesterday. Not finished it, I'm just this is literally the first time I've used it, I haven't even deburred it, I don't know if you can see burrs on it there. Yeah, it's got some sharp edges on it. But I thought, well, oh, it's usable, let's see it, let's see it in use. So here's the new setup of death. <laughs> it's it's wires everywhere. We have a 12 volt battery which has been charged overnight. I don't know how much power is left in it. It is jump cabled on to this lead here, which is going up to the black terminal. And then the red terminal has another fly lead on it with the red jump lead attached to it going to the positive side of the battery. So a positive and negative connection. Now, what you need to know is, if I turn my meter off, and we'll put the meter into diode testing mode, this yellowy creamy coloured terminal is connected to this black terminal, is connected to this blue terminal, but well, if the wires aren't connected, then it isn't connected to the red terminal. And I'm not disconnecting it again, just to prove it. The red terminal is not connected to the other three. And these three terminals that are connected are dead short. So the black and the red terminal are open circuit to each other with nothing connected. And I promise you, I'm not disconnecting everything again, just to test it. Yeah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> it's too complicated with that tool. And I'm not bringing more tools out. I've got tools everywhere. So anyway, what you'll find is you'll get a dead short on those three and then that will be open circuit. It just happens not to be at the moment because it's all the wires are connected to the battery and blah, blah, blah. So I've connected the negative and the negative is above the wires which come out for the control circuit. So I've connected the black lead to negative, the red lead to positive. And then from the wireless circuit, I've done the same, red lead to positive, black lead to negative. And they're all connected and they're all powered up. Let's put the meter back into voltage that wasn't very conclusive. Turn it back on again. Now, yes, we've got more in the shot. When I connect up here, there is no voltage. But if I connect up here and here, there is battery voltage. Okay. So these are the outputs. And this is turned on. So if we go to out, we get a positive voltage, 12.57 volts. And if we go to in, we get a negative voltage, negative 12.5 volts. This battery's going down already. Yes it is. So that's working. That is the setup. So I'm out too at the micro miller machine and yes there's a junior hacksaw on there with the blade in at a stupid angle and I was using that 
to cut out for the bracket that I've just made for the winch and that piece of manky plastic which looks like it's been burnt because it's been heated by a blowtorch to conform and bent, heated and bent just as insulation because that's going on top of the relay for the winch just in case one steps on it so it doesn't short out here is the auxiliary plate drilled and tapped I'm not sure I'm going to show a video of this I've done a video of making this but I'm not sure I'm going to show it anyway that goes in there they all line up beautifully then I was going to put this unit here that I thought oh, there's not enough room plus there's going to be like wires up here which are going to be exposed I can get boots, I can do many different kind of things, but that is insulation enough. So when that slips in there, which it does, just that holds the remote control unit on top of it. Basically you can see it now, no you can't. I thought it was going to lift it up. There. We'll just go down to the motor so that will drop down this side to that motor end and that will drop down that side to that motor end. So anyway, there's got to be two wires coming in and this is going to be there. And you're thinking, well yeah, just bring the wires in from that side. And I could do that. But I'm thinking what would be an even better idea is now to drill two holes in here and put two glands in. And then have the wires go through two glands. Oh, excuse me. And then bolt an Anderson socket down here. Maybe. Or just have uh, tails coming off with two, two clamps on which can clamp down to a battery. Alright, we're on the winch. But I thought I'd show you this for a start. I got given this. This was not working at all. I am currently in the phases of repairing it. This on off switch inside, both the live and the neutral run through it and then they go through a ferrite ring, they get curled around a ferrite ring and then into a motherboard, the main power motherboard. This is the terminal that came off it. The live or the neutral, I don't know which one it was. I wasn't paying attention, I just saw all this burning inside it. Now the story behind this welder is, there's all that burning inside it, and the terminal on the motherboard, pretty corroded. It was until I cleaned it. Now, anyway, the story behind this is, it's been into repair before. The first time it's packed up, they replaced the cable. And instead of crimping on new ends, they soldered these. And obviously, whoever stripped that back, they stripped it back too far. And that's the earth, by the way. And the uh, heat shrink that he put around it, I've removed the heat shrink, by the way had burnt through there, chafed through. Whether that was the problem with it, I don't know. I've been trying to get some of these ends so I can put it back as standard, but they are proving hard to get. So I have just ordered a set of blue female spade ends and I'll replace all those ends. Then obviously I looked further through my electric drawer and I found a pack of 10 lurking right at the bottom, so that's that. This has got a, whatever that is, 16 amp, 32 amp connector on it and it's got some high voltage uh, HT lead silicon to take up the difference in the size of the cable. This is a 200 amp welder, it will not work for 13 amp socket properly, so it's going on to me, uh, whatever amperage that is, 32 amp socket, to make it work. And the earth cable 
it is longer than that, I've just wrapped it around inside and pulled it in just to keep it neat and tidy while I'm repairing it. Anyway, enough of the welder. That will be coming soon. That, uh, I'm not sure what I've been told. It's, it's, I think it's Pulse DC, so it does aluminium. Big, obviously. Anyway, the winch, it has evolved. It has evolved tremendously. And I've just made these cables. Okay, so I'm gonna obviously attach these now and they'll be drooping and dangling in that kind of area. And another one will come up here. Where is it? It's here. And that will be drooping in that kind of area. Now I've got an old jump lead. It's got a pretty good end on it, red end, and I didn't have the corresponding black one because that at some point had been burnt out, hence these these were being chucked away, and I salvaged them. The black, the the, the copper in the black end in the black lead was naff, absolutely beyond it. Anyway, that's a pretty good sized cable. I think that is 16mm square, it's classed as. The relay in there has 6mm terminals. Now I've just been down to buy some and they fit this nicely. I've just used four to make these two cables up which go from the relay to the motor. Both these cables are thicker than the cables to the brushes inside, so they're ample, and these are easily ample, but longer, so there we go. So I bought them, and they're not big enough to on that cable. Then I remembered on the solar, in my attic, I'd bought some more 6 mils, but they weren't the right size, so I discarded them, but they were for the solar. So they're only whatever mil square that is, the solar cable. Not good enough. I'm not going out again, so I have to make some. Recently taken a printer to pieces. I liked the look of this steel inside, thinking this is going to be some kind of nice steel. Although now I'm saying this, it's probably, this probably is going to be nice steel. Using the printer steel, it ends up it's it's highly polished, maybe chrome plated, mild steel. At best, it could just be Mickey Mouse metal that these brother printers were made. I, I stripped a brother and a Canon uh, laser color printer, two of them. They're both identical basically inside. Outside they were slightly different, but in, inside the internal workings were clearly made by the same company. Anyway, back to the point. These are steel. This, I hope, is steel. I might try and anneal it, just in case it is stainless steel. I don't think it is. This steel goes just only just over those wires so that'll be a good match and in fact before we start we can see how good this steel is because I can crush this end so these are linesman's pliers and they have a, um, a crimping end in there for crimping electrical connections so let's see what kind of crimp we get out of this can we crimp it? Yes we can. That is going to crimp beautifully. So I'm pretty sure that this steel is going to make the terminals I want. At this kind of area, I did another flood test on this. When I flooded it, it almost pulled off the back. Hopefully that footage is in here. Anyway, that was last night. There's no more drips on the floor and the PTFE I've just put on last night has worked.
so that's good. Come back onto the table again. Now, the remote control unit, you've seen the two wires which I have put the automotive waterproof connector on. The other wire, we've got a positive and a negative. One's got a 6mm terminal crimped onto it, and the other one's got an 8mm terminal crimped onto it. So, I didn't have any small ones. They both come off. 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 And I will fit some of those. First things first, if I grab this, and I'm not sure, I'll just turn the camera around so I can see it over there. Thing. I'm not in the way, not at the moment on that. When I move the mini mill, it'll give me about an extra foot that I probably won't be in the way. So, if I grab this now like this, to get enough purchase on that for cutting, it may slip out. I may push too hard and slip out. That is the chance I'm going to take. I do have some soft jaws, but I've only put, I've only very, put very light pressure on here. So this might go pear shaped. What's happened now? Nah. I've just hit the welding table with the drawer opening it. Now, that's got a lot of stick out. And I don't want that amount of stick out because we're too vibratory. If I grab it this way, and not too viciously, hopefully I can do it without too much hassle. So I'm going straight into the circuit groove. The teeth on this are too far apart but I can't bother to change it for a 32 or a 42 blade, so I'll struggle. And yes, I'll struggle. No, okay, I'm going to change for a 32 blade. Let me come back. I'm going to have to get a proper blade for it. Right, so there's a used Baco 32 tooth blade. Should suffice for doing this thin wall stuff. It is being installed. Put some tension onto it. We'll see what that goes like. Now clearly it takes longer to cut. It's a bit nasty, isn't it? But we can put up with the, the longer cut as it's a lot easier. With the works I'm using both arms because it's easier. So much easier. I have the two tubes lined up on the vise and I'm putting the bigger of my M6s next to it. I've given myself approximately a millimetre extra and I'm going to mark where the crush line is. So I need to crush it about there, about there. I don't want both sides to be crushed, did I? So the problem I'm having with this is it's crushing both sides. I didn't want that. Mm. See, on the original, they've sort of bowed it as well. Let me in here. So it's sort of bowed backwards as well, and that isn't happening right at the moment. Alright. So before I go any further, so although it's making a nice crush, it's crushing it centrally. I don't really need that. Ah, but I could flex it. So yeah, mm, I want it in line really. So that isn't doing exactly what I want. Uh, 
And now, well, I may or may not be in the way for a lot of this. But I've got to concentrate on what I'm doing, obviously. So, for a start, we will try and do that. Not going to work. Don't know if it damages it too much, but not if it damages it too much, if you know what I mean. So. Hopefully this is going to work. Well, at least work better than it did before. So now, what do I want? That's going to hurt. So the, the top pit here, it is cleaner. This does look like stainless steel, this bit does. It looks a lot like stainless. So, that is how it's going to be. I'm going to stuff the wire in that, then I'm going to crimp that onto the wire. Before I do that, I'm going to pop a 6mm hole in that and just round the edges over. Now, here's a funny one for you. Got one of these. Does it do this? Oh, it's going to work now, is it? Oh, there you go. Does, does it do that? So it doesn't really work. Well, what I do is to get about another 40 or 50 hits out of it, but with threads point towards the top. Take that bit with the hole in it, looks like that. Get a really fine diamond plate and make a circular motion. I'm not trying to make it flat, we're trying to make it slightly curved, slightly convex, and really smooth. The smoother the better. back in with the hole to the bottom, spring on top of that and then screw that together. And I've bent my spring like that, can you see that? That helps it as well. I think you've seen the bend in the spring there now. And also my pin is bent as well. Okay, I think you've seen that now. This is harder to polish, but you can polish it. Spin that as well when you're doing it. Just spin that a little bit. The smoother the better. not perfect but it's just polished the end of the diamond. Spring back on again. The pointy end points in towards there and the big smacky end uh, comes down to hit the that bit. Screw it back together again. Make sure you put your mark in the right place. This is going to be a 6mm hole, so it needs to be more than 3mm from the end. That is 5mm from the end, and nearly 8 from the other end. So that's a bit too close to the start. I'm going to come about a millimetre further out. Yep. One more that again. measure that again that's 3.56 I've gone a little bit too far because if I drill that at 6 mil now it's going to be very close to the end so in between those two marks in between or oh, actually we'll move it across there we go there and it works every time for around about 40 or 50 more times okay I've got you in close and the first wire is through. I'm not sure if you can actually see inside there. 
Yeah. So I'm just going to push the second wire through. So I'm not putting any heat shrink on, which I could do. As they come through, they come through an insulated silicon shield and that pops straight on. Did you see that go straight on? Yes, I think you did. That being the positive, that'll have the red wire from the wireless unit on it. It'll want a washer on it and the nut. Alright, here we go. I have a black lead and I have a red lead. Let's put the red lead on for a start and leave the black lead off and explain some things. So, you can obviously see the winch motor here and you can see the bottom plate that I made and that went straight on beautifully. We're not tight here yet. Just noticed. We're not tightened these yet, okay? Then all four of these are tight. So the base plate. Then I have this plate which is uh, a U channel or C channel with a section cut out which slips around the relay itself. That has two holes drilled into it, which has two silicon rubber insulation sleeves from recycled ignition coils out of Vauxhalls or Citroëns. I think they're Citroën ones. One Citroën, one's Vauxhall. So I've recycled those as insulators and grommets. Then there's a piece of 3mm ABS plastic, which I've cut oversized then heated up the blowtorch and bent it round as an insulator just in case someone treads on it so they don't short the wires out with a steel plate. Then on top of it there's a wireless unit. This is the handset for the wireless unit and underneath it is a winch relay and it is quoted to 150 amps. I guess that's the maximum instant rating on it and it's probably got a a constant rating of 75 amps or something like that. This motor is about 50 amps, 40 or 50 amps. I did work it out the other day from the resistance to the windings but I cannot be bothered to do it again. It's these thin wires which are amp power cables or speaker cables from an amp to a speaker. Um, <coughs> excuse me. These will pass 30 amps They've got two of those each, that's 60 amps, so that's all that's powering down to the motor. And inside the motor, the brushes, I've got thinner wires than those, two per side. Uh, so, this is the negative cable that's going onto a battery which has some charging in, in it, I don't know how much. And there was a small spark. So now, all I want to do is turn this on and see if it works. So can you see that? Um, marker pen. Can you see that V? I don't know. Can you see that V? Telephoto in a bit. Can you see that V? It must be close to be able to see. Let's see. There we go. You can see that V now. I had a screwdriver underneath it propping it up and it's getting a bit side heavy now. There we go. So, I'm going to press in. And then I'm going to press out. That's it. It's a winch. That's what it does. <laughs> now I need to put the winch cable on. And for that, it needs to be bolted down. So, next, let's uh, switch that off. Disconnect the earth first, take off the positive last. 
this piece of insulation that I put on here is quite handy for clipping onto, although I might make some clips here, or just literally wrap it around and clip it on there. For the time being, it's quite acceptable. So right now I have a standalone uh, 500 kilogram winch. It's approximately 500 kilogram winch. Could probably do with making a, a thing to hold it, although it probably clip on actually to be fair. It does! <laughs> it clips on! <laughs> so I can leave it clipped to it! It's amazing! <laughs> it's, it's amazing! <laughs> right. Now, let's take some clip that before I break it. There is the underside of the winch. Can you see it all? No. There is the underside of the winch. My plan of action is to triangulate out from the bottom. If I say triangulate out, make a triangle out from the bottom, but not with that. A piece of steel. I was thinking about heating that up, straightening that out. As you can see, that's sort of a triangulation pattern. Anyway, bolting that there. Going out that way and then having a single hole in that and then I can have floor anchors around the workshop which have got the stem bolt taken out of them and a hollow down the centre but a cap bolt going into each one so to use each one I would take out the bolt that's in this probably, take out the cover bolt out the floor, put the winch over the hole, drop down the pulling bolt, tighten it into the floor, then this will be anchored to the floor somewhere. At that point, let's say it's at the back of the workshop, let's just bring out a wider angle. Let's say that's anchored down here somewhere, right where the bench is. And there's a car outside the front there and I, it's dead and I want to bring it in. Now instead of pushing it, I could anchor the winch down there at the floor in an anchor bolt, put into the floor just there, and then tuck the car in here. Vice versa, I could have a couple of stainless steel fixings out on the driveway for pulling cars around in the driveway as well, or anything else around the driveway for that matter, but people understand cars. The first use for this, is for pulling the big machines around. 